This piece will feature frank discussions of sexual assault and violence towards women. It will be disturbing to some people. I think that this topic is very important, and while I do not wish to glorify the violence, I'm going to discuss it for analytical purposes. In doing so, we can learn from these experiences and reinforce our conviction that this behaviour is not acceptable. If you don't want to hear about it, please, I implore you, do not watch this video. It will be triggering, and I don't want to ruin your day. Alternatively, if you're squeamish about this subject, I will be providing time codes that will allow you to skip the most egregious examples of violence. The year is 2018. I am 20 years old. I'm taking a gap year between finishing year 12 and starting university. I work on a farm with my family, and I spend long hours out in the field with my own thoughts and a pair of headphones. I'd always wanted to be media literate, but I didn't really know where to start, so I began to look up charts of famous albums and listening to them. Very quickly, I begin to appreciate the significance of your David Bowies and your Led Zeppelins. I'm having a blast, and I even started to post little reviews to my Instagram stories. During this time, I gained a taste for the avant-garde. Before, I generally liked like Nine Inch Nails, but I didn't really know why. So I push further into the world of noise rock. I learn about Lightning Bolt, Shellac, Tropical Foxstorm, an entire range of kooky artists. One evening I'm browsing some music forums and I came across a best of the decade so far list that isn't half bad. And it's here that I first come across legendary Rhode Island quartet, Daughters. This is the self-titled album by Daughters. I'm immediately stunned by the song's ferocity. I am in a room that's losing oxygen, and it has been replaced by noisy static. And somehow there's this incredibly danceable tempo. The music sounds like it's from hell, but the vocals sound like they're from a hootenanny. It's relentless and fun. I grew more interested when the hit arrived. The guitars swirl down the drain. The bass, the vocals, the drum fly like kites in a storm. I was informed by several breathy think pieces that this was the band's magnum opus. This was their last album together, and this was as good as it gets. And in 2018, I'm generally inclined to agree. It isn't as punishing as some other noisy albums I had heard, but that's fine. It's groovy. There's a finger snapping, foot tapping quality to the songwriting, and my adrenaline is overcome by the pitch of it all. It's an album that I really like, but I don't love. I only return to self titled to listen to the hit. I barely give the band a second thought, as I explore the realm of music, and I do discover music as a deep and abiding passion. I set up a record collection, and it turns out that 2018 was one of the best years for music that decade. There are dozens of albums that change me and my taste, and I discover music from a few different creators. Of course, The Needle Drop needs no introduction, Dead End Hip Hop teaches me a lot about the history of rap, and I get one hell of a schooling from deep cuts. But perhaps most influential to me, I lurk in Facebook shitposting groups for recommendations. Communities for my favourite bands like Queens of the Stone Age, Ghost, Led Zeppelin are all quite boring. They're all older than me, the memes are plain, and they all just want to stay on topic. But younger listeners, like the people in these hip-hop groups, are hungry. They will listen to anything and everything, regardless of their taste. And a lot of interactions in these groups and recommendations I receive are something that I actually really treasure. I become an incredibly obnoxious person, with a heavy dose of autism and a new special interest every week. I ruin my housemates' lives by playing music very loudly and then telling them about how the music they like is bad actually. I am a bit cringe for sure, but I'm still learning. And then November of that year came, the afternoon of November 2nd. I am at work, inside a laboratory and I am pressing bags. I take my break, and my newsfeed is on fire. Everyone is talking about the new Daughters album. I, I didn't even know the band had gotten back together, and I gather that the Needle Drop has given their comeback album, You Won't Get What You Want, an extremely rare 10 out of 10. I remember being so captivated by the album art. The use of different textured brushes is really interesting to my eye. The rough and broad outline of the forehead, the smudged liquid jawline, evocative of semen, as if someone had used their seed to paint the whole thing. It's perverted, it's miserable. The eyes in particular really grab me. There's almost no life to them, except for the right eye that seems to squint ever so slightly, as if it was flinching from pain. The thousand yard stare of this image was immediately subject to hundreds of excellent memes. Even after all that, it still stares into my soul. Eventually, like, I stopped looking at this cover, and I actually dug into the music. 
And after 50 minutes, I genuinely felt as if I was a changed young man. You Won't Get What You Want is one of my favorite albums ever. It deeply affected me like no other album I've ever done, or since really. I still find it difficult to talk about. I was only able to articulate my thoughts a few years later. I actually wrote a personal, I'm just showing off my records at the moment. I wrote a personal review that was just shy of 3000 words. And I'm going to borrow liberally from that. Daughters combined that groovy rhythm that I found so intoxicating on the self-titled album with a new style, a maximalism, a new length, a new appreciation for writing out a lick and seeing where that can take you. We don't have rules as to what we're supposed to sound like. Get the right sounds, set the right mood, and then just like ride it for a while. The songwriting for you has that, but the production is another beast entirely. I'm not using hyperbole, but I I felt it in my bones. I, I felt physically ill after my first listen. It was an ache similar to betrayal. I hadn't realized in that moment that you had tapped into some of my deepest fears and anxieties. Where self-titled made me feel like I was on fire, you made me feel cold, frozen, in pain. There are some hints to Slint's Spiderland with its song structure that draws the listener in. It embraces experimentation like this heat's deceit, but it felt closer to Swans to be kind's tortured atmosphere. Daughters are influenced by dozens of different genres. Even though they hate being called math rock, the rhythms are certainly evocative of that style of music. You catch yourself trying to figure out the tempo in between the panic attacks. There is still a smattering of their grindcore roots, but now they have an appreciation for no wave and post rock. These songs are about evoking a feeling in the listener, and the songwriting is also a catchy bonus. It makes you feel compelled to return to this nightmare again and again. The distorted drums of its holocaust by bullet tempo disorients you on City Song, the opener. And yet there's these bongos that smooth it all out. The painful noise of this guitar, the shrieking, paints a world that is ethereal, frozen, and scary. And then it melts away as the dam bursts and a harsh wave of noise swallows you whole. The one-two punch of City Song and Long Road No Turns primes you for what kind of album this will be. A nightmare carousel bursts in, uninvited, and shrill blasts attack you from multiple directions. You aren't able to figure out quite exactly what's happening. This song has a sense of constant movement. Not necessarily a forward momentum, but it is constantly expanding and retreating into itself like a horrendous beating heart. And yet, this is where I catch a whiff of that finger-snapping groove again. I'm struck by the lyrics by frontman Alexis Marshall. They paint a picture of someone whose life is bad, but they don't have the agency to escape it. Alexis sings, Everybody climbs up high, then falls real far. A little is all it takes. I thought that this song was about hope. People tend to have ambitions for themselves. They want to be able to climb higher in a system because they want better lives. But for some, it is impossible. And this song is about the destruction of hope. Well, ain't it funny how it works? Someone's always got it worse. They hit the ground harder than you. The characters here lack agency, and that was what scared me. It's about anyone who tries to fight against the void, the absurd, against a situation where nothing is left for them to do but to sit down and rot. And Satan and the Weight continues in that trend. Air raid sirens expand slowly while drums and bass march together. It's sinister, but danceable. And towards the end of the song, these bright guitar strings burst in. It's as if they've been resurrected, and they float up towards heaven. They're a bastion of genuine beauty within this war-torn battleground of an album. And with the discordant cries of this world is opening up, the tone sends shivers up my spine every single time. The poetic license Alexis infuses into his lyricism makes them a lot of fun to interpret. People have called this the moment of the Antichrist making his grand return. It's a moment of absolution, a moment of beauty and bliss. And no matter what you think of the album, it all comes crashing down with The Flammable Man, the most intense song on the entire record. It's the shortest track here at 2 minutes and 10 seconds, but it barrels through the energy of free songs at the same time. A return to their grindcore roots, if you will. It is loud, disorienting, and it's an absolute rager. Where the rest of this album feels icy. This song feels like it's the final moments of a man who has accidentally set himself aflame. Alexis sings, I don't lie awake at night for a good time, because it's fun. I don't live near the ocean anymore, out of fear that the tide will turn. The ocean can be seen as a metaphor for death. It's nothing. You drown in it, it's huge, and you die. 
and that notion of the ocean is what truly haunted me. I think that, generally, I am a person who has a decent grasp on their own mortality. I will die one day, it will not matter, and the universe will not remember me. You will not remember me. Nihilism doesn't scare me. But my body does. You see, at the time that I first heard this album, I had this paralyzing fear of my fight or flight reflex. Which sounds incredibly silly, because it is. It is rooted in some mistakes that I made when I was younger, and how I'm afraid of my family. The lizard brain takes over my body and my inhibitions, and it just makes everything worse. That's the anxiety. And I have lots of problems in that area, and only recently have I ever gotten over it. But when this album first came out, I was not dealing with it well. <laughs> Ocean Song features a man named Paul who is a character who has appeared in multiple Daughters songs. The narrative follows Paul as he flies into an uncontrolled panic attack when a primal terror takes over his body. His children try to talk to him, but he just keeps running. And the song culminates with Paul running towards the ocean. To know, to see for himself, if there is an ocean beyond the waves, beyond the waves. You can see this as Paul leaving his miserable life and trying to find true meaning in life. That's the main reading, but I think Paul actually runs into the ocean to see if there's life after death. The primal terror brought him to suicide. I think this because the vocals drown in the mix as Paul presumably drowns amidst the waves. To me it isn't subtle, but it is frightening. Ocean Song itself is an immense piece of art. It has these bright sharp guitar lines that freak out with these lock and step percussion and bass lines. A wall of noise builds, and it lumbers towards its final conclusion. It really does kind of give you the feeling of, of being chased. This song kind of turned on my fight or flight reflexes. That exploration of the fight or flight reflex is something that I have long known about through therapy, but I hadn't heard another artist articulate that horror before. And it really spoke to me when I was 20. The rest of this album is supremely well structured. I love Less Sex, which is a chilling cooldown. It allows you to relax just a little bit, but the atmospheric soundscape still unnerves you. And the lyrics paint the portrait of someone succumbing to depravity, as if a possession took over them. Guesthouse is a horrifying closer. You are being hunted by these indescribable guitar wails and deafening drums. As Marshall Wales let me in, you wish they just would so the song would stop, and once it does, you start the album all over again. It's an adrenaline rush like nothing else. You Won't Get What You Want is a foundational piece of my taste development. I don't think I was able to appreciate the weight of it my first time around, but I know how it made me feel. At the time, I really valued that feeling. I thought it was just an incredible piece of art, but as I reflect, as a person who's more confident in himself, I can't help but see this album as a bit immature. Like, don't get me wrong, the band wrote the hell out of this album. The songwriting is sublime in the true definition of the word. I love the tones, the grooves, the structure of the thing, but when I return to the lyrics, I feel like something's missing. They're clever and poetic, but I don't get anything from them. Marshall wallowing in nihilism and pointing at something scary is interesting thematically, but I realize it doesn't really mean anything to me. Paul ran around like a lunatic and scared his children because of a primal terror. It's nonsense. So this begs the question for me, and I've been thinking about this for years. Why do the lyrics on You Won't Get What You Want feel so incomplete? I know where we can start to answer it. Secret Sunshine is a film by Li Chang Dong. It was released in 2007, and it stars John Doo Yon and Song Kang Ho. It's one of my favourite movies of all time, and I'm going to spoil some major elements of it. I highly recommend it, so if you'd like to see it, please skip to this time code. The film follows Shanae, a bereaved widow who returns to her husband's city of origin with her only son. She's settling in fine, but after a botched ransom kidnapping, 
Her son is murdered. Shanae is consumed by grief, and she starts to have terrible chest pains. She finds that they are relieved after attending a church ceremony. So here, she finds new purpose in becoming a born-again Christian. She finds community in these people, and she seems to have found a way to attempt to cope with her family's passing. Part of Christian ethics is forgiveness. In this case, Shanae does not need to be forgiven by God, but she feels compelled to forgive the man who killed her son, because that's what the church has taught her. She isn't quite ready to do this, but she tries anyway. Her friend, Kim Jung Chan, accompanies her to the prison. She even brings the murderer flowers, and her aim is to convert him to Christianity so that his soul might find absolution. The killer is surprised to see her, but not displeased. Shanae says, Her monologue is timid. She can barely look this man in the eyes, but she still tries her best to stick to this script that she's developed in her head. She says that through the death of her son, she's found God's love, and she's thankful for God's grace. And we just have to watch her life collapse around her, as the killer reveals in prison he too was born again. Shanae is devastated to see the killer reflect her words. He claims that she is here because he prayed for her. She doesn't want to forgive him in the first place. And now she's been had. The butt of a cruel joke. Shanae falls into a catatonic depression. And in an attempt to comfort her, her friends tell her that she's good for trying to forgive him. They begin to pray so that they might find the answer as to how Shanae can forgive the killer. They pray for her, as if she's no longer in the room. She disrupts them to speak her mind. She spends the rest of the movie fighting against her relationship with religion. She fucks the reverend, he didn't need much convincing, and she rebels against her Christian community. She finds her own autonomy, absolution, in her heart. It's still hard to contend with the grief and the suffering. She realizes that God was a serious help to her. It stopped the pains in her chest. And it did give her a sense of community. But she also learns that people can use this ultimate force as a shield. The teachings of Christianity can be twisted by bad people to make them righteous. It is impossible to ignore that South Korea itself has a complicated relationship with Christianity. After World War II, Christianity was introduced by American missionaries as a tool of oppression. And now, one third of the country is Christian. Lee Chang Dong is disdainful of religion, but he knows that it helps people like Shanae. So the ultimate message of Secret Sunshine is that forgiveness is not the only answer. She stops letting false paragons talk down to her, and she takes her life back into her own hands. She didn't move to this town because God said so. She moved to Mia Yang to be closer to her husband in death. She no longer uses God to justify abuse that was done to her. Christian Hater is a force of nature. You listen to her music and all you can do is bear witness. It is, at the same time, beautiful and scary. Despite her name, Hater is Catholic. At times, she struggles with religion. The wrath of God is a consistent theme in her lyricism. The music itself is quite difficult to describe. It technically falls within the genres of industrial and noise music, but interestingly, it is combined with classical music and dark wave. The closest comparisons you can make are to Deandemus Gallus with her wicked operatic vocals. <laughs> and Anna von Hauswolf, who sings like a siren trying to eat you. What separates Hater from these amazing artists is her background. 
She is an academic and she's very artsy. And did like a weird multidisciplinary practice there that did incorporate the voice, but also incorporated different elements of, of the things that I learned about there, which was like performance art and film creating sound in a different way, like more kind of avant-garde or academic sound art stuff. So it's best to see her work as performance art. Many of her concerts feature her walking amidst the crowd, screaming and bashing herself. It looks a bit silly on paper, but the music is extremely compelling. The extremity of the music is unfortunately paired well with the subject matter of her lyricism. Christian has been on the shit end of several abusive relationships, physically, emotionally, sexually, and she does not stay quiet about it. There's no right way to be a survivor. Like some days I'm a terrible mess and a terrible person, and some days I'm super strong. There's no fucking right way. And that ferocity, that anguish, is present in her vocals. Her screams are not just aesthetic, they aren't cool, they are her fury. Her 2019 album, Caligula, is challenging, not just for its abrasive nature, but because it is a deep dive into domestic violence. She uses the theatrics of neoclassical darkwave to her advantage. The swelling instrumentation scores her banshee-like screams as she curses all who have done her wrong. The brutal quality of her music has been compared to black metal. Now, the first wave of the genre hurt to listen to, but it hits different to other brands of metal. The brutal quality of the recording is contrasted by compelling songwriting. Ultimately, the meaning of extreme music is music that's meant to be like exclusive or exclusionary and not inclusive, so it doesn't approach any sort of mainstream ideas of what of what music should be. And I believe that Hayda took this lesson as well. By taking the best from beauty and pain, she creates something truly unique, an indescribable cross-section of multiple genres. And it is her willingness, her daring, to push the boundaries that makes her a really exciting artist to behold. Her style of lyricism is most influenced by Christian hymns. Repetition and fervent belief colour her lyrics, all the while she makes music that would frighten Satan himself. Do You Doubt Me Traitor was the first song that I'd ever heard from Lingua Ignota. I was reading a best of 2019 list, and Caligula was high up there. I'd seen some buzz about it in the Facebook groups, and I saw that this was the most popular song, so I gave it a listen. It's a slow build. It starts with these gentle and unassuming piano keys, that are in conflict with these dark, rich keys at the opposite end of the piano. Hater demonstrates her singing and acting abilities on this song. At first, she has a meek disposition. It's like she can barely bring herself to speak over the gentle piano. A common motif of hers is using two different characters in a song to demonstrate her point. It's kind of like a Socratic opera. In this case, we have a person who is lamenting their love of God. And then we have a powerful godlike figure. The first pleads with their master to not doubt their devotion. The lyrics are structured in a way in which an idea, the hymn, is isolated. And meaning is created when you contrast the two hymns together. So, verse 1 How can you doubt me now? How can you doubt me? is contrasted with verse 2. Every stone on every mountain is etched with my name. Every vein on every leaf of every tree is slaked with poison. We can see that this is not a conversation in a traditional sense. The lamenting sinner is begging forgiveness, while the powerful figure is asserting their power over all that exists. If we view this from the lens of God, we see Ignota struggling with the cruelty of the world he created. For the sake of salvation, she must bear witness to untold horrors. That's compelling, but if we view the song through the lens of an abuser, the song becomes ever more harrowing. So, I want to state right here that this is all my interpretation. There are several ways in which we can read these lyrics, and despite how I look, I am not an incredibly hot and brilliant genius, but this is the most interesting read to me. The couplets above portray the character's vulnerabilities, but the abuser's narcissistic need for approval, for absolute unquestioning power over their victim, is striking. How do I break you before you break me? The building pressure of this song, the surging orchestration and haters screams, fill you with panic. The first time I heard this, I was on a bus to work, and it left me reeling. <laughs> Tears swelled in my eyes, and I felt myself struggling with that fear again. I couldn't bring myself to turn it off, because I was just so stunned. 
Not because the music is so wildly experimental, from a progression point of view the song isn't terribly complex, but because the extremity was all in the performance. The abuser is a figure of immense pain and fleeting love. Hater relays the blunt reality of domestic abuse. When you are subjected to abuse, all you receive is pain and a few fleeting moments of tenderness. You try to help the abuser, even though they don't want to change. All you want to do is be next to the person who you fell in love with. The lamenter meekly retorts, My friends all wear your colours. Your flag flies above every door. To me, this is the willingness of men to overlook their friends' abuse. They never challenge their behaviour, and they just pretend it never happened. At the slightest challenge, the abuser interrupts the lamenting sinner. But bitch, I smell you bleeding, and I know where you sleep. Do you doubt me, traitor? Throw your body in the fucking river. I'm the cunt killer. Deep and seething misogyny underlies the abuser's language. Misogyny is about power. The abuser needs to assert themselves over a victim. That power is maintained using control tactics involving humiliation and dehumanization. The victim, having been humiliated, repeats, I don't eat, I don't sleep. I don't eat, I let it consume me. Hater has a long history of anorexia. Sometimes, when people can't control the world around them, they assert control over their bodies in unhealthy ways. As the song concludes with a surging wave of bass, she laments that pain. Overlaid vocals highlight the most painful moments, and unable to escape the overwhelming power she was under, she admits defeat. This is the genius of Linger Ignota. You can read the lyrics in multiple ways at once. A survivor, an abuser, a worshipper, a god, a parent, a child, the superego, the id. Dialectics is a method of philosophical investigation in which you try to accept two extremes at the same time. Black and white make grey. They are often contradictory, and the point is to see what you can learn when you crash two polar extremes together. Caligula is abrasive and beautiful. Together, it creates something that you never thought possible. I don't see this album as catchy music. I don't think that many people would just chuck this on while they're doing laundry. But it is a profound and moving piece of art. The songs on Caligula feel a bit formulaic. The structure always resembles Do You Doubt Me Traitor in some way. This is not a criticism, because the formula is great. It is used to great effect on my favourite song, May Failure Be Your Noose, which is the ying to Traitor's yang. Both feature the victim-abuser dynamic, but here, Hater is more defiant of the abuser's wishes. When they sing, Who will love you if I don't? Who will fuck you if I won't? She replies, May failure be a garment to wrap around you. May failure be a belt with which to gird you. May failure be a noose with which to hang you. The failure is not just because the abuser has lost influence on their victim, but it is also the failure at compassion, at humanity, at love. It is their failure which dooms them, which makes the abuser unable to love. And that's what makes them prey on the vulnerable. The abuser continues to be vile and try to influence her, but they can't do it. And they throw a wailing tantrum as if becoming vulnerable will lure the victim back into their clutches. You have cut me down. I am gone like a shadow at evening. I am shaken off like the locust. I am losing. She remains steadfast, watching this abusive monster crumble down as if their world is ending. Everything burns down around me. Everything burns down. Caligula is not about being a victim. It is, in fact, about expressing that victims of violence and abuse are powerful unto themselves. How can a ghost scare you when you have seen the worst of men? Lingua Ignota is a deeply feminist project, but one of the most interesting things about it, and what makes it so appealing to such a wide male audience, is that the music itself isn't about violence against women. Instead, it displays the ugly violence of toxic masculinity, and it forces you to confront it. And I think in, in a kind of a scary way, that's why it resonates with a lot of people in the extreme music community, and especially a, a lot of men that I wouldn't think it does, because it isn't, it doesn't come from that traditional feminist perspective, it comes from a perspective that they recognize, almost. Yeah, yeah you're speaking their language. Mm -hmm. 
The text is about intimate partner violence at its core, and it has attracted a large audience of survivors who identify with her message. Hater hath become the death dealer. She controls her own destiny, like Sinead. And she uses religion to contrast the apparent absolute morality of an abuser, and it gives us a powerful message. Spite. Spite alone holds me aloft. The coming section will feature descriptions of intimate partner violence. I am relaying this information for analysis purposes. Please use the timestamps provided to skip the most egregious examples. Daughters and Linger Ignota became cult figures in the American extreme scene. They had followings before the Needle Drops reviews, but they certainly boosted their careers. In 2019, Ignota seemed to have come out of nowhere as a hot artist, whereas Daughters had just resurfaced from an eight year hiatus. Both had critically acclaimed albums and both shared a similar fan base. In fact, in this promo video, you can see the drummer wearing a Linger Ignota shirt. So during their 2018-2019 tour, Daughters got Linger Ignota to support them. It seemed like a dream team. Alexis Marshall and Christian struck up a friendship. He watched me perform and immediately seemed interested in me, focusing on me backstage and after our shows. I tour alone, or with a driver who does merch during the shows, so touring for me is often solitary and lonely, and I was flattered by and enjoyed the company. I found him charismatic, handsome, and astute, sensitive. Alexis attempted to pursue a relationship with her, but on the advice of a mutual friend, she tried to keep things strictly platonic. She later found out that he had a wife during this time, and she was lying to both of them. Eventually, Alexis love-bombed her and won her affection. Christian told him about her complex history of romantic relationships, and they began to get personal. During late 2019, the two started a relationship, and she moved across the country to Pennsylvania to be close to Alexis's kids. Hater paid the rent for their apartment, for their furniture, and everything else. Alexis did next to nothing. He showed no interest in seeing his kids, and he quickly became abusive towards her. Their relationship is detailed in a 7,000 page statement that Hater released in 2021. Now, I'm not going to dispute the validity of this document. Hater's claims have been substantiated by other women who have had similar experiences with him. In this document, she says that Alexis has borderline personality disorder, and she frequently had to look after him. Marshall has long marketed himself as a tortured soul, a pained artist. Now, personality disorders are heavily stigmatized, and as a person who is very close to someone who has a disorder like this, I want to pause to say that people with BPD are not intrinsically broken or abusive. According to Judith Herman in her book Trauma and Recovery, Borderline patients find it very hard to tolerate being alone, but are also exceedingly wary of others. Terrified of abandonment on the one hand and of domination on the other, they oscillate between extremes of clinging and withdrawal between abject submissiveness and furious rebellion. They tend to form special relations with idolized caretakers, in which ordinary boundaries are not observed. Borderline patients, when treated, can go on to live perfectly satisfactory lives. But like any conditional illness, you have to get treatment. BPD might be part of the explanation, but it's far from an excuse. Marshall allowed his mental illness to get ahead of him, and it only exacerbated his worst traits and impulses. I wanted to be sympathetic and supportive and not shame him for this behaviour, but Alexis used self-harm and threats of suicide throughout our relationship to manipulate me. Alexis was showing me that he could be violent and extremely emotionally reactive to small events and I immediately stopped feeling safe in our home. As a survivor of severe abuse, Keita has complex PTSD. Alexis would disregard and shame her for her episodes. He would insult her appearance, weaponizing her history of anorexia against her, and he would degrade her intelligence. He claimed that me doing these things made him feel dumb, so I stopped doing the things I loved. Reading books, going to museums, watching films, and listening to music. She found the contradiction between the adoration that she experienced at the beginning of the relationship and the seething resentment that she was now experiencing to be quite alarming. Alexis claimed that he was flat broke and he couldn't afford anything, so she also wanted to help him get back on his feet. This turned out to be a lie. In fact, he had thousands of dollars in a bank account that he just never told her about. He also used this broke excuse to not see his children. He would simultaneously refuse to see them and also blame Hater for getting in the way of their relationship. 
He blamed her for things that she couldn't do and shamed her for things she couldn't have done. Wicked Game is a cover of a Chris Isaac song. The original was a lusty ballad about unrequited love, and Ignota's version features Marshall on the chorus. It was released in August 2020, at the height of this relationship. Fans find the song quite disturbing now. I find a choice to cover this song quite interesting. The cover is condensed from the original, and certain lyrics have been repeated. The world was on fire and nothing could save me but you. It's strange what desire will make foolish people do. The unrequited love of the original takes on a whole new context. The protagonist in the original sings about how the woman he is yearning after has done this to him. What a wicked game you play to make me feel this way. As if she decided to lead the protagonist on. It's blaming her for tempting him when she did nothing wrong. Ignota's cover twists this sexist concept into something sinister. I, I tend to choose songs that kind of I feel relate to what I'm dealing with in my life in some way. Uh, or I thought that by performing them, it would put them, yeah, put them into the realm of like my very upsetting world, trying to take something pre-existing and give it a different context, I guess. Here, you want a person you care for to stop hurting you, and they refuse to meet that tiny demand. They keep reeling you back in with promises that they will change and everything will be different this time. Ignota sings on the chorus. And I don't want to fall in love. She doesn't want to be hurt, to be vulnerable. Alexis sings in the background. This girl is only going to break your heart. That feels so ominous in hindsight, because he's the master of this wicked game. He could stop playing it at any time, but he is far from showing Hater respect. His contribution to the song is minimal, and yet it colours everything. It's strange what desire will make foolish people do. Ignota is fighting for validation, for salvation. She wants so desperately for this conflict to end. It is deeply affecting to listen to, because the pain in Hater's voice is so raw. In early 2022, she released a new version of this song, with Marshall removed. The new version sounds more cohesive. All the while, the fandom watched on as if the relationship was serene. People originally thought the Wicked Game was sweet. I remember following both of them. Hater would tweet about Marshall singing the Home Alone theme. I thought it was cute. And when she announced that she'd got spinal surgery, no one suspected that it was Alexis's fault. She probably uh, skipped the next section if sexual assault upsets you. Violent BDSM was a large component of their relationship. Alexis disregarded the essential trust and need for boundaries that normally characterizes healthy BDSM relationships. Hater explains that she submitted to Alexis's fetishes because it was the only way that she could feel validation in their relationship. And often her response to this violence was to freeze and fawn up to him. She often felt taken advantage of within this realm of dubious consent. Even after explaining that this had happened to her in a previous relationship, he would still guilt and shame Hater into comforting him for his violence. During one sexual episode, he bent her back so much that she suffered from a major lumbar disc herniation. He broke her spine. Not only did Alexis refuse to take responsibility for this injury, he refused to help her get around. Because this injury caused her major damage to her spine, walking and movement became incredibly difficult. She became subservient to Alexis. She can only describe it as a nightmarish period of her life. You will take your legs and your will to live. She moved back with her family in San Diego for the surgery, and Alexis abandoned her the day before she was scheduled to go under the knife. And that lingering sense of betrayal never left her. Here in San Diego at my parents' house, um, I just underwent spinal surgery two weeks ago, or a little bit less than two weeks ago. Um, and so I'm here uh, getting, having gotten the surgery and then uh, doing kind of my preliminary recovery here. The 16th track off of the Marshall Mathers LP, Kim, is hard to listen to. Eminem wrote a bitter song about an abusive relationship with his ex-wife, Kim. Eminem might not be writing about his actual thoughts, but he is directing these extreme feelings 
at a person he clearly feels some resentment for. He claims he loves Kim, and that he wants to kill her, so it becomes clear that he's not actually love her. Eminem acknowledges that he has treated Kim badly, but he distributes the blame equally instead of taking responsibility for his own actions. Lingerick Noda had the idea to make an album that was exclusively covers, to highlight misogyny in the music industry. Wicked Game was one of them, but her cover of Kim was meant to be the first single. The project is seemingly on hiatus though. Both songs are roughly the same length, 6 minutes, but Ignota cuts down the lyrics considerably, from about 720 words to about 250. Most of the narrative where Eminem distributes the blame equally is gone. With the lyrics that Ignota left, we see the reality of an abuser choosing violence. It is a more honest version of the song, even though it is less traumatizing. The final lyric of this song is turned from a furious refrain into an eerie hymn. You are supposed to love me. Now bleed, bitch, bleed! This tortured anti-hero character is revealed to be a heartless killer. He isn't relatable anymore, because he's given no humanity. Alexis went into rehab shortly after the surgery. I remember seeing this post and really feeling for the guy. I recalled vague allusions to addiction in his lyrics, and I thought it was unfortunate that he'd relapsed. According to Hater, even though she was still in recovery from her surgery, he still used her for sexual gratification. After getting out of rehab, he made a post on social media that talked about how he was healthy now and how he wanted to support other struggling addicts. Hater later discovered that he'd made this post to discover new people of whom he could groom. Cheating was a constant in their relationship. Alexis would both accuse her of infidelity if she ever spoke to a male colleague, and he would cheat so that he could wound her. If she so much just liked the band's post on social media, he would have a meltdown. Hater tried to leave him. He threatened her with suicide, and she stayed. In recovery, Alexis developed a sense of moral superiority. I watched him preach the virtues of honesty and accountability in his meetings while lying to me daily and refusing to acknowledge any wrongdoing. And an interesting thing started happening. He started to weaponize the program and his therapy against me. I was the problem, he was the victim, just trying to get better, and I was preventing him from doing it. How I was preventing him from doing it was very unclear to me. I was supportive. Nobody had greater incentive to want Alexis to recover than I did. He hurt her back again that December, rendering her almost immobile. He blamed her for slacking off of her exercises. She attempted suicide at the end of the month, to which Alexis complained about her behaviour. Once she got better, she broke up with him. During the course of healing, Hader connected with some people from Marshall's past, and things began to fall into place. I discovered he had been fired from a previous job due to sexual misconduct. I discovered he regularly sent photos or videos of himself masturbating to people who hadn't asked for them. I discovered he had a reputation for taking advantage of vulnerable women, and that a lot of people felt taken advantage of or used by him, and that nobody was off limits. Fans, friends, co-workers, subordinates, wives of good friends, etc. There were claims of harassment, ultimatums and assault. I confronted him about what I had learned, and he didn't deny a single thing, but had a different angle, victim blaming. She was wearing a mini skirt and literally shoving her pussy in my face, he said about one woman 15 years younger than him at the time of their relationship. Suddenly she wasn't okay with it, and I got fired. As a survivor of violent sexual assault, all of this was extremely upsetting to hear. There's no other words for it. It's disgusting. He became distant, refusing to speak to her when she brought up the abuse. She couldn't make heads or tails of it, and as she processed what had happened to their relationship, she just felt so ashamed by the whole thing. Defiled, humiliated. It happened again. She didn't tell anyone until after the storm had passed. And it was within this headspace, this living situation, this torment, that Sinner Get Ready was written. Hide your children, hide your husband. Sinner Get Ready is more stripped back than Caligula. It doesn't feature insane screaming or very many terrifying musical breakdowns, but 
What it does feature is more emotionally poignant lyricism, a more complicated relationship to worship, and a much more approachable musical palette. Much of this album takes place in rural Pennsylvania, which is where she lived with Alexis at the time. The folk history of that state is a large element to the album's identity. There are references to folklore, and many of the instruments used were found in local tip shops. I'm from Tasmania, the other side of the world. I don't feel quite qualified enough to speak about how the wilderness influenced her, so I'm going to focus my attention elsewhere. I have to admit that the first time I heard this album, I didn't care for it very much. I thought that it was very pretty, but I think that I wanted something to blow me off my feet like Caligula did. It could be that I was going through a rough patch at the time, and maybe I didn't have the emotional bandwidth to handle the nuanced literary nature of this music. I love Caligula. I think it's my favorite album of hers, but I cannot deny that Cinna Get Ready is far more interesting. While she doesn't scream, her voice trembles a little bit more. There are almost tiny mistakes. Her voice, as gorgeous as it is, isn't perfect on this album, and I think that's a really fantastic change because it highlights her vulnerability and fallibility. To be human is to make mistakes, and Hader's relationship to God is oh so human. She's unsure of herself, and resentment often comes through in her language. There are moments of genuine bliss in worship, but her command over tone and the music is far from unsure. The instruments here add a timeless, almost cultic quality to the album. This is demonstrated on the opening song, The Order of Spiritual Virgins. It is here that we know that we are not going to get the same album again. It has angelic vocal layering, a mild drone, and rich piano chords. And as pretty as it is, a storm is a brewing in the background, leading to these intense piano jump scares. I love how it sounds. It's unpredictable, as are the lyrics. Hide your children, hide your husbands. I am relentless, I am incessant. I am the ocean. I think this is the voice of God, speaking to this order of spiritual virgins. Chastity seems to be a theme throughout the album, and that is contrasted with constant discussions of sexual assault. But most of all, I am struck of her use of the ocean in the lyrics. Ignota really liked You Won't Get What You Want, and the ocean represented death there. I think Hader is mixing metaphors here to reflect the power that Alexis held over her because this album is about her struggle with that relationship and her anger over God's silence. This is represented by an audio clip at the end of the track. So apparently this came from a reality TV show where people lived in the wilderness. And the man in the clip speaks about the pure bliss of silence. Everything has a rhythm and a beat and the silence is one of the <sighs> most soothing ones. I just love to hear the dead silence, if that makes any sense. He waxes lyrical about how silence is the most soothing rhythm. Hater seems to be in two minds about this. Silence can be both soothing and it can be deafening. It's pleasure and pain. One of the many dialectics that Hater uses is known by psychologists as the dialectic of trauma. Survivors of abuse and combat have two common and opposing tendencies. As described by Judith Herman in her book, Trauma and Recovery, Survivors have the tendency to dissociate from violence. This is what she calls constriction, and it comes in many forms, such as the repression of memory, or the tendency to believe that the traumatic event was a dream. This drive is often in conflict with what is called intrusion, where the body remembers the physical and psychological damage that was inflicted on it, whether that be triggered by flashbacks from someone touching the survivor, or their tendency to relive their moment in dreams and their actions, which is often called the repetition compulsion. Often unconsciously, People do this to take control of the event, to change it retroactively. These two forces are, of course, in conflict, and are two of the major symptoms of PTSD. The survivor's desperate need to forget and then to confront the trauma is described by Herman as a kind of oscillating rhythm. The survivor must be heard, but is pained by noise. Silence is comforting and deafening. The dialectic of trauma is used very purposefully in all of Hater's work, but I don't think it's ever more heartbreaking than it is on this album. I Who Bend the Tall Grasses is about God's indifference. The song is coloured by these ancient organs that repeat the same chord progression over and over, representing the daily plight of the protagonist. Sinister vocals heighten the drama, while shimmering chimes break up the monotony of the chorus. That's not to say that I dislike the song. The structure is a very distinct artistic choice and it strengthens the narrative. A lamenting character is asking God for vengeance against their abusive spouse. Glorious father, 
intercede for me. If I cannot hide from you, neither can he. When there is no interference, she questions the nature of her devotion. Why does she have to be a servant to an all-powerful god if he won't use his power to stop this violence? This character becomes bitter, jaded, and they conjure the imagery of Abraham and the death of Christ. Take hold of my gentle axe and split him open. Gather up my quiet hammer and nail him down. From the perspective of Christians, the Old Testament God is framed as cruel for asking Abraham to kill Isaac, and only at the last minute does he spare him once Abraham has shown his devotion. But in the New Testament, God is framed as compassionate. Sure, he kills Jesus for the sins of mankind, but he resurrects him. The New Testament also reframes the Abraham story so that God shows the same compassion. This has been used by Christians to fuel a sense of superiority. The old God was tyrannical, but our God is compassion. Hater rejects this. She has tasted blood and she is intimately aware of a compassionate God's cruelty. And in a fury, she commands, I'm not asking. You understand? He belongs to me, you understand? It is my voice that bites the back of a cold wind. The motif of the cold wind, the power of nature, is also referenced in the song title, bending grass so that God may pass over it undisturbed. And I, it is I who bends the tall grasses. It is I, I am the one, I am the only one, I have to be. This line is very revealing to me. God is chastising her for thinking that the abuser is so horrible that they are worthy of his punishment, that there is anyone who could rival God's importance. This is frustrating because when you grow up religious, privacy doesn't really exist, as you have this constant awareness of divine surveillance. It is maddening when suffering from domestic abuse. You believe that God can see this, and you are aware of his inaction. Ignota is saying that God demands love and selflessness, but God doesn't care about those who worship him, and all the protagonist can do is weep. I don't care that he can't help it. I can't do it again. The notion of God's plan of free will is being challenged here. In media, the abuser is often framed as a kind of force of nature. They can't stop themselves. This is the way they are. Ignota challenges that assumption by demanding accountability. The abuser chooses abuse. They choose violence. They choose not to take responsibility for their actions. The ocean can overwhelm someone. It can cause them to fly into a great panic. But to allow that terror to consume you, to not fight it, and to just allow it to take you over is cowardly. Hater's insistence for justice and retribution is in stark defiance against any of these notions. And that's why this song is so powerful. Many Hands is about the many forces that lay hands upon women. This is a song that examines sexual assault in confronting but interesting ways. Primarily, it is told from the perspective of a powerful lord. Distinct from God, he proclaims, Upon your pale, pale body, I will put many hands, and rough, rough fingers for every hole you have. And a hymn seems to play in the background while the protagonist commits this violence. I heard a lumbering in the sky, made me think my time was nigh. Won't be the water, be the fire next time, and time is coming when the sinner must die. This hymn is taken from Ignota's debut album, Old Bitches Die, an album about violent retribution if there ever was one. In referencing, she is creating parallels with the coward who beat her and this Lord character. This hymn represents a hypocrisy. In the back of his mind, the Lord chants a God-fearing hymn to purge himself of any guilt and shame he feels, as if his piety absolves him of his violent actions. Hater highlights this discrepancy because it is important to understand the psychology of the abuser. This is highlighted by the chorus. One of the women that the Lord victimizes fights back and takes control of the narrative. The Lord spat and held me by my neck. I would die for you, I would die for you, he wept. The Lord held me by my neck. I wish things could be different, he wept. She shows the true nature of this lord, this powerful man, who proclaims that he cannot stop himself while claiming he is righteous. Ignota once again states bluntly that abusers are incapable of love. They desire control above all. Australian author Jess Hill wrote an enlightening book called See What You Made Me Do, and it is illustrative here. Within the history of the study of domestic violence, there have generally been two schools of thought. On the first side, we have the psychopathological school, which proclaims that abusers have symptoms and they can be recognized and treated. 
gender doesn't seem to have very much, if anything, to do with domestic violence. And then we have the patriarchal feminist school of thought, which claims that male entitlement to women's bodies has everything to do with domestic violence. Hill performs her own dialectic analysis, and she finds that both of these schools have to be accepted at the same time to understand the true nature of abusive men. These men are often violent because they feel that they have failed at masculinity. Patriarchy makes men feel powerful, structurally, but individual men don't feel this power. Hill further argues that there is a big difference between how powerful an abuser seems to be and how they actually feel. The Lord is weak, and he has to establish his power over women to make himself feel powerful. Hill writes about a case where a man murdered his ex-girlfriend. Wider media mocked him for his excuse of feeling humiliated by her. Hill examines the horrifying truth of the matter. The fact that in the moments before a man takes control, he can feel at his most vulnerable and powerless. Just milliseconds before feeling the flush of power and pride that comes from reinstating dominance. She further argues that the triviality of their shame further compounds it. And many hands displayed this discrepancy in such an incredible way. The Lord's weakness allows him to commit violence, and then act wholly. Themes of guilt and atonement are a constant theme on the record. The first half of the album features the most pain and the most suffering that we've explored so far, but the second half of the record is more complicated. It features genuine devotion and joy in some sections. But it is complicated. Within the Lord I cast off all my earthly bond. At the heart of Cine Get Ready is disgraced American televangelist Jimmy Swaggart. His rise and fall are the stuff of legend. It's a complicated story, so I'm going to oversimplify a bit, but essentially, Swaggart accused another minister named Marvin Gorman of sexual misconduct. Gorman sued Swaggart for defamation, and he won $10 million in court. Gorman's son took it upon himself to follow Swaggart, and he caught him cheating on his wife with a sex worker named Deborah Murphy. Gorman took this information to Swaggart, and offered to remain silent so long as he retracted his allegations of sexual misconduct. Swaggart did not respond. A year later, Gorman took these photos to another minister to have Swaggart defrocked. A resulting police investigation led to Swaggart's fall from grace and his famous I have sinned speech, which was broadcast live on television. I have sinned against you, my lord. And I would ask that your precious blood would wash and cleanse every stain until it is in the seas of God's forgetfulness. So all of this is relevant because both Swaggart and Deborah Murphy show up on this album. Swaggart was known as well for his worship music as for his preaching, and he was quite a successful pianist. His fall from grace seems to have transfixed Hater. I was uh, taken with his story of disgrace. Mm. It had an interesting parallel in my life at the time. And so he became kind of an emergent figure, this kind of godlike figure who is worshipped by so many people and who presents himself um, as godlike and behind the scenes is being anything but godlike. Swaggart's speech concludes the sacred liniment of judgment. The song reads as a sincere piece about the bliss of worship. She starts the song singing about how her wounds have been healed. O oh, sinner, hast thou ever had the blood of Christ so lovingly applied? The sacred liniment of mercy with downy fingers bind. Liniments have historically been used for dressing wounds, and the use of the word downy, which is generally associated with soft things, speaks of the healing property of faith. It is warm, it is wholesome, but it is contrasted with the use of Swaggart's speech. On first impression, it feels genuine. Swaggart is crying, and his delivery looks as if he's genuinely remorseful. But we know, with the benefit of hindsight, that Swaggart would cheat again with another sex worker a few years later. He tells everyone in his congregation about how wonderful his wife is, and he appears to be humbling himself before God so that he can continue to profit off of his congregation. I think that Ignota put this here because both she and Swaggart are asking for absolution. They both want the blood of Christ to wash over them but Ignota seeks salvation from violence, whereas Swaggart seeks the preservation of his career. 
Hater wasn't saved, Jimmy is still rich. This is in stark contrast to Man is Like a Spring Flower, where we have an interview with Deborah Murphy, in which she doubts the authenticity of Swaggart's plea for forgiveness. Uh, you were shaking your head as you were watching those pictures of Jimmy Swaggart. What were you thinking? I just, just, he's up there crying, and I know those tears aren't real. How do you know? This can't be. I mean, because he was up there preaching about all this stuff, and then kind of doing it. She says that Swaggart seemed like such a different person when she knew him intimately. But couldn't his tears of repentance be real? Well, maybe, but to well, me, I don't really think so because some of the things I've seen, you know, he's a totally different person than when he came when he seen me. Murphy knows Swaggart in ways that his congregation simply cannot, and the rest of the song waxes and wanes on the nature of the soul. The heart of man is an orchid. It's an open gulch. It's the seventh gate of hell. It is a horse's crushed tail. And Ignota further explores the nature of Swaggart's soul with her multimedia art piece, Epistillary Grieving for Jimmy Swaggart. Dear God in heaven, I am sorry for my sins, the way I've lived. Released in part for a Bandcamp Friday event, this was a short visual album made up of spoken word and poetry. It's quite easy going on the ears, and I want to talk about it quickly because I think one of the reasons that Ignota is so enthralled by Swaggart is that he was forgiven by his congregation, he's still employed by the church, and this album is made up of letters addressed to Swaggart. She explains, I started writing letters to Jimmy in October 2021 as a way to process trauma, eliminate self-doubt, and argument the ciphers and themes of Sinner Get Ready. This is intentionally not about music, it is about language and image, and how meaning shifts between mediums, who is speaking, and who is being spoken to. The letters have repeating themes, but there is a much larger emphasis on the nature of forgiveness. Jimmy was a godly man who was in it for the money, so she asked in her first letter, My mouth is full of blood. Jimmy, when you spoke of hell, did you mean this place? Did you mean me? The problem with being a godly man is that you aren't really allowed to make mistakes, because worshippers want the clergy to be authentically pious. Ignota recognises that Swaggart is flawed, so she feels a kind of connection with him. A man will break your back like it is nothing. He will not ask your forgiveness, but you will have to forgive him. Swaggart didn't deserve forgiveness, but he got it. I don't think this should be misconstrued as envy or malice. Instead, she seems to be fascinated by how forgiveness works. Hater tried to forgive her abusive partners for their violence and their inner turmoil. Since Swaggart was forgiven, she asked him how that felt. As a godly man, how did it feel to receive something he didn't earn? On Hell, she questions what Jimmy knows. Hell is no joke. How do you know the walls are of Jasper? The gates are of solid pearl. How do you know the streets are made of gold? You had better be sure. You had better be certain. It bears mentioning that it's easier for a rich man to fit through the eye of a needle than it is for him to get into heaven. I don't think that she's questioning the nature of God, as so much as she's questioning the certainty of his getting into heaven. Because if Jimmy dies and he goes to hell, then he wasn't much of a shepherd, was he? What happens to everyone who worshipped him? And to anyone who bought her albums? Sinner Get Ready is a thoughtful and heartbreaking album. Hater yearns for connection, for true love, for her faith to be answered. It would be easy to claim that this album is pessimistic, but I don't think that it is. Her relationship with Marshall was gruelling, to be sure, and it caused her incalculable amounts of pain, but it seems that her faith helped her in some way. Maybe God didn't intervene, but perhaps the lessons that she has learned in her life allowed her to see what Marshall really was. It allowed her to leave him. In the end, she learns her value as a person. She doesn't deserve to be at the center of a wicked game. On the solitary brethren of Ephrata, a gorgeous closer, an audio sample plays of a lady claiming that she won't get COVID because she goes to church. And Hater is not just pointing and laughing at this person. The lyrics that follow portray genuine and fervent belief. No longer shall I wander. Ugliness is my home. Loneliness my master. I bow to him alone. Don't ask what God can do for you. Don't use God to deny science. Use God to help you when science fails. Science can't grant you meaning. Christian Hater knows that her life is ugly, but being alone without a partner is the best thing for her right now. She deserves a healthy and loving relationship, but she must heal before she can offer that to someone. And I think that's one of the final takeaways of this album. To function as part of a whole, your half has to work. 
That's why she reminded me of Shanae so much. Her struggle is her healing. Dear Jimmy, will you kneel with me? I never stop bleeding. Barn burner, a bright snap in the night. I pretend I am not humiliated, undone and rebuilt again and again through great pains. Sin and Get Ready was an album that Hater was very nervous to release. She was immensely proud of it, but she was worried that the fans wouldn't like the new sonic direction of the album. She found out that she was wrong to worry, because Sinner Get Ready was even more critically acclaimed than Caligula. I feel like I just have to give this a 10. Terrifying. Like, quite terrifying, yes. With Hater's intentions fully understood, Sinner Get Ready not only gains more gravity acting on the guillotine blade as it comes down, but the head that it intends to decapitate has a face that we all can now recognise. These are people who walk amongst us. They make great art that in turn can lure us in with a sense of security. But it's never any less tragic when we walk into their traps. And the thing is, is that I haven't even touched on like 90% of the lyrics on this album, I could have just read out so many chunks of this. I feel like the impact is already there, you know what I mean? Like you don't necessarily need to read out every individual lyric because I think if you listen to this, you can catch those moments yourself. I think it's beautiful, it's awe-inspiring, but it's also scary. Hedo was surprised by all of the positive feedback. She remains incredibly humble about her work. She was open to answering questions about people's interpretations, and she was just happy that people liked it. All the while, she began healing from her experiences with Marshall. She cut him off, but became increasingly frustrated at his complete and utter willingness to accept responsibility for his actions. In a Reddit AMA he did in July 2021, some anonymous users confronted him about his past of abuse, and all he could do was lament about how everyone was out to ruin his career. In an interview with The Needle Drop after the release of Sinner Get Ready, Anthony Fantano asked Hater about the allegations she brought up against Alexis Marshall. It's like, what made you want to come out and sort of like speak about that and I guess like spell it out in the way that you did now at this point? Mm -hmm. um, the truth. I wrote the record about this experience. Um, that's what it's about. Uh, that's the document for me. Fantano asked beforehand if he could bring the topic up as to not put her on the spot. It's not easy. I left that situation like a fucking hole in the floor. I was nothing. I was, I'd been reduced to like essentially servitude of this person who um, didn't care about me and I'm just trying to heal. And it's important to me that the truth is out there and that my truth is out there. Um, because unfortunately this behavior predates me by quite a bit. When things like this happen, you expect to see a large amount of backlash at the victim. You'd expect Hater to be swarmed by a bunch of anti-feminist shitheads, but there weren't really that many of them. People categorically believed Hater. Her honesty came through clear as day. Um, and it's not to say that I'm a saint or like a paragon of virtue, um, but I didn't deserve to be abused by this person and um, he's gonna do what he's gonna do, but I have to focus on myself. And Marshall threw a hissy fit, claiming that he was exploring legal options. He's done no such thing. Everything that he's released by himself has been removed from major platforms, and in wake of hated allegations, Marshall was removed from his record label. It's not about like canceling someone's band. It's not about asking anyone to not listen to daughters. It's about this person's behavior is unacceptable and what do we do about it? You know, uh, I can't control Alexis. I don't have any control over him. Daughters are now a band that exists in a state of purgatory. The previous December, they announced on their Patreon that they were taking another hiatus. I stated before that I think the songwriting on you is absolutely phenomenal, and I will stand by that. And I would be against condemning the entire band for the actions of Alexis alone, but unfortunately, the band had defended and stood by him throughout this entire affair, and they have condemned Hader for speaking out against him. In particular, guitarist Nicholas Sadler has been especially vitriolic about her, so I won't defend the band's integrity, because if they had any, they would have kicked out Marshall a long time ago. This is where the situation is at today. Marshall is out on a farm somewhere. 
He's off social media, in hiding, and no one really knows what the future will hold. Dialectic philosophy makes the art of Caligula and Sinner Get Ready just so much more vibrant. And I think that with all of this story and all of this context, we can finally answer that question that I started the video with. Why do the lyrics on You Won't Get What You Want sound so hollow? It's because they're the inane poetry of an abuser trying to justify himself. From an academic standpoint, we are fortunate to have an example of an abusive man expressing his pessimism and inability to care about others in a particularly articulate and poetic way. Let's return to this album and examine what he leaves out of the conversation. So, I'm sure that I could cherry pick individual lines and make myself feel smart for doing so. But I'm not interested in doing that. <laughs> Instead, I'm going to talk about some of the songs that have changed dramatically for me now that we have all of this context. From a structure standpoint, Less Sex is still perfectly placed on the album. After the chaos of the previous five songs, you need a cooldown. It has a bluesy feeling to it, accompanied by this gorgeous, soulful guitar murmur. The lyrics are simple, but affecting. The first time I heard them, I read the song as about being about a possession of some kind. I let it into my home, let a long way down. It might well be the ocean again, ruining everything and making you lose your mind. But. The title is so obvious to me now. This is about the spiral of addiction, a possession by desire. Alexis has struggled with alcohol and sex addiction for a very long time, and this is as good a time as any to bring out another disclaimer. Sex addiction, like BPD, is heavily stigmatized. Addiction can consume your life, and it requires a lot of support and openness to treatment to get away from it. But we know from Hater's document that Alexis would preach the virtues of sobriety and then essentially just use her for gratification. He didn't take his treatment seriously, and he used these illnesses as an excuse for his shitty behavior. He's not an asshole because he has a mental illness. He's just a reprehensible asshole. His hatred of women has compounded and allowed him to inflict terror and pain onto them. The only solution that he can come up with, the only way to be a good person, is to have less sex. I gave it complete control let a long way down. From his point of view, this is framed as a sacrifice, a temptation that he must overcome. This force, the it in question, is not passive in the narrative. Alexis might allow it into his home, but it asks to come in. He lets this force into his mind and into his heart. Because of this, my new reading of this song is that the it is actually a woman, or at least the manifestation of womanhood. This is why the music video is almost entirely a naked woman trapped in a void. Notably, a snake is wrapped around her head. Is this the snake that tempted Eve? Probably not. This isn't what I think the band actually intended, but it is alarming that the message seems to be, due to Marshall's struggle with sex addiction, letting someone into his heart leads him down a dark path. His spiral into violence and depravity is not his fault because he couldn't control himself. He can't be held accountable. I still think that Long Road No Turns is about lacking agency, but it's different now. Alexis is slave to his passions, and damned if anyone takes issue with that. Well, ain't it funny how it works? Someone's always got it worse. They hit the ground harder than you. Someone has the audacity to complain to you that you hurt them, and then you retort that your life sucks too. Everyone's trying to ruin my career after all. The universe is cold and dark. You lack compassion and you just say, So don't play along or play a part. Don't look to me. Under the weight of your shoulder cross. These are just the words to somebody else's song. Even in the narrator's apathy, he acts as if he lacks agency. It's hard to care for other people when you yourself are suffering. This is a fallacy. He tells them not to look to him for salvation, and yet he still tries to one-up the other's pain. So what if they hit the ground harder than you? That means that you have the ability to pick them up. It pleased others that someone else wrote that song. Don't scoff at it. Connection is all we have on this long dark road with no turns. Walking alone isn't cool. It's just sad. The reason they hate me is always read to me as a little bit of a temper tantrum. It used to be cooler though. The characters on this album are clearly not happy with the state of things, with its refrains of Don't tell me how to do my job. I think what the band were going for was a punky rager about critics. But I don't know, again, I don't know a lot about, you know, 
music journalism or, or, or criticism or anything right now. I, I, I probably maybe have like an archaic Hemingway-esque type of, of, of feelings about it where like if you give me a bad review, I want to go and punch you in the nose or some shit. Like. <laughs> but I think that reading is skin deep. I view it as a kind of meta-examination of morality. The critic that Marshall is raging against is a higher power who dictates morality. This is not a cancel culture tirade, but he's talking down to those who think they know better than him. Hoping that emotionless trip's gonna pay off. You're gonna hope and wish all day. If you could slide a couple fingers under the skin, will you find the affirmation that you need? The lyric is about criticism getting under one's skin, as if critics were high school bullies who just wanted to get a rise out of him. But this reads less like a critique, and more of an edgy announcement that you can't hurt his feelings because... Nihilism. You can't tell me that my behavior is unacceptable because that would ruin my career. It's not fair. This moral relativism isn't funny, but it is a bit laughable. Ocean Song is still about that primal terror that I started off this piece with, but as much as it affected me back then, it reads very hollow today. The narrative is still interesting, but someone losing their mind over a multitude of nothing is just bizarre now. You can almost read the song as a going postal anthem. On an ordinary day, you just snap and you run away from responsibility. But that isn't the human experience. That's allowing nonsense to control you. The lyrics, as nice as they are to read, highlight Paul's lack of agency. He explodes through the backyard like he's shot from a gun. Now the road, punching upwards into his soft, naked feet. Every other force in the universe is compelling him to act like a lunatic, and I understand that fear. But allowing yourself to be a worse person with this excuse of nothingness is bullshit. Paul is not a wild animal. He's a father, and all he's doing is traumatizing his kids. Guest House remains an insane closer. It sounds like a nuclear silo, melting down with these dysfunctional sirens and panicked vocals. And the lyrics match this fevered energy. There's a lot of imagery of doors and locks. The general consensus of the community is that the narrator is trying to obtain something from this room, hence why he cries, let me in. And I think that's completely valid, but I view it differently. I think that the narrator in Guest House is Marshall's addiction. I have come the distance where you can't see. It is there, believe me. Now let me in. This is how Marshall conceptualizes his inner turmoil. It's a desperate struggle against committing violence against women, as if it's out of his control. The song reads as a frantic sprint to get ahead of his urges. We put a padlock on the cellar door. Let me in. I've been knocking. Let me in. Who bricked off the chimney? I can't hear you speak. This isn't so much as the battle between addiction and sobriety, it's the inane murmurs of an abusive monster. To be around someone, to love bomb them, to lower their defenses, and all the while you have this imaginary dog chained to a pole and desperate for blood. It's a fantasy. You are not Jekyll and Hyde. You are real. You could not relinquish control. You don't rape someone because the darkness took over you. You rape because you need to humiliate, because you don't recognize their humanity, their agency, or their personhood. This is all an anemic justification for violence. It was desperate. It took me over. No. You are a grown man. You could not behave like this. This is unacceptable. I'm not policing you or calling you out if you'd like to listen to Daughters still, because your Spotify streams are not going to influence the band very much. But if you want to listen to them and you also want to support victims, Pirate Daughters, Pirate House of LOL, do not give abusers money. It's haunting, isn't it? I don't think that I'm alone in reading You Won't Get What You Want as a kind of character portrait about an abusive mind, but I think the only way that I can read it now is in tandem with Ignota's work. Because Marshall is the Lord. He is the one who seeks the powerless. He needs someone to take care of him during his episodes. He needs someone to pay for his rent and someone who he can use for violent sex. Every excuse an abuser can throw out there, I couldn't control myself. It's not me, it's the ugly world. She brought it on herself, it's not my fault. It's all in here. And they're worded just poetically enough, so that you can read it in a slightly different way. Poetry might be subjective, but abusive behavior is not. And this is behavior that we must be careful with, because we can all fall into this trap. 
Other people are just NPCs. It doesn't matter. We'll all be dead one day. I refuse. Because the world is cruel enough as it is, life is valuable. And the fact that the universe is unfathomable makes this place right here incredibly special. You are the master of your own world. You have to do better. Don't make people disappointed in you. You should let everything burn. Because the heat of flame is warming, while unrequited love is but icy flesh. Nihilism is empowering because we get the pleasure, the flame, of creating meaning. Everything burns. It's not an excuse. Don't leave people cursing your name while you die, because otherwise you'll end up like Jimmy Swaggart. Trauma does not need to exist for great art to be made. Linga Ignota is not great because someone assaulted her. She's a great artist because she took the feelings of unresolved trauma, the pain, and she managed to create a skilled piece of art to express those feelings. Her work is deeply cathartic for victims of abuse and trauma. I felt validated and challenged by it. And I felt compelled to tell this story because I think it's important. History is written by the victors, but in case of abuse, the victor wins if history is never told. I watched all of this happen in real time. I saw rumors of Alexis being an abuser, and I looked the other way so I didn't have to confront my admiration for his work. I watched on, as someone became frozen by their lust and their apathy for other human beings. And I saw someone else reduced to ashes, and yet rise like a phoenix. Ignota had her voice heard around the world. And I was really looking forward to seeing her at Dark Mofo this year. But, unfortunately she caught COVID and she had to cancel. Which is fine, of course. <laughs> but, if I got the chance, I was going to give her my copy of Secret Sunshine. Because I thought she might identify with Shanae. She might enjoy watching her fight on against the silence of God. I thought that she might like how she fights against her own meaninglessness and the cruelty of the world. Maybe not. Ignota admits that maybe she puts a bit too much of herself into her music. And don't get me wrong, I, I'm not a fool and I don't think that I know her through her work. But I admire her because, despite everything that's happened to her in the last couple of years, the untold horror that she has seen, she never gave up her faith. I, I don't know how. But I can only wish her the best in her travels, up that long road with no turns. I... I am deeply grateful for your work and your bravery. Believe survivors, and thank you for watching. The bandwidth of what women are allowed to say in music, it's like, you know, there's one teeny shelf in Ikea yeah. and that's it. It's like, it's the red one or the blue one. Yeah, exactly. And it's scary. Mm -hmm. And I'm only really realizing a lot of this stuff as I get into my late 30s and 40s and I backtrack and I go, oh my God, wait. And now, you know, now I'm them. I feel so fucking lucky and, you know, meeting people like you and knowing that there are people who just manage to like get out of there. <laughs> and yet so many women are still stuck in there.